We know that when we make these recommendations, there are costs that are tied to them and really finding what resources that we have that we can help them offset if they were to try these practices and use them as a model to see what can happen when they're integrated on an, on an operation. This episode of Voices from the Field is the second half of a conversation between Latrice Tatsy, a soil scientist, the cultural science lead, and the intern supervisor for the Pecani Lodge Health Institute of the Blackfeet Nation, and NCAT Sustainable Agriculture Specialist, Linda Poole. Latrice focuses in this episode on the management practices her research has suggested and how she measures their success. You can find the link to the first half of the conversation in the notes below. A rancher herself on the spectacular Rocky Mountain front of Montana, Latrice, whose Picani name is Buffalo Stonewoman, works with cattle and bison producers to improve the health of the land, the water, and the people where her relatives have lived since time immemorial. Let's listen. I think it would be really good to, to get your perspective just, you know, on the particular practices that might help ranchers adapt. And I've heard you talk a little bit about rotational grazing and making sure that land has plenty of recovery. I heard you mention capturing water through snow fences and through um, beaver dam analogs. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. I know that there's discussion about bale grazing and could, could you just kind of give us an idea of some of the management practices that might be helpful if ranchers are thinking about how to adapt to climate change? Sure. And so for me, what it really goes back to is seeing what resources you have available that are already on the land. And for, for us, that was, you know, going back to all the other previous practices that you talked about and now looking forward and seeing, okay, now that we have different ways to put things into the ground faster, what are, you know, what do we really want to hone into? And so for us, it's just having professionals, a part of the team go out. And so right now we're working with a few producers on bale grazing and what that might look like, because we know that when we make these recommendations, there are costs that are tied to them and really finding what resources that we have that we can help them offset if they were to try these practices and use them as a model to see what can happen when they're integrated on an, on an operation. And so right now we're looking at trying that down in the more eastern part of the reservation they call it the seville area and that's probably um five to ten miles that given area is five to ten miles east of our cut banks on the further east side and so given that area you kind of understand if you know what those when you talk about the golden triangle and mm -hmm. as it gets really flat and seeing those wheat fields and so understanding what that land topography is and in knowing that that land was heavily farmed and knowing that that soil is really compact, compact, and it's really hard to get a, a shovel in there. So when looking at bale grazing and understanding what the benefits are to it and how much you got to leave and wanting our producers to know that, you know, we will be there near cows to help set up the electric fence in this process because eventually it has to be fenced off to where the animals won't have access so we can see a year down the road what the benefits are to that by implementing it this winter. And so that's one of the practices that we're working on with one rancher and looking at the potential of doing it with more. But because of the price of hay right now, we're taking that into account on how that will influence what our producers are able to do. And so just having these pilot studies of seeing what can be done in, with these projects and how in the coming future that we can make them more feasible and sustainable and how we could do them across the land in larger areas. That's what it really comes down to when we, when we start these 
pilot projects and integrating them on into the land with with our producers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really excited about bale grazing. I tinker around with it here with my place, and I've just been wowed by the outcomes. Uh, I love the idea of helping people test it out in a way that is low or no risk because we are on the edge in agriculture. So many of us, um, price of hay is astronomical. Um, price of cattle and, and especially of sheep is on a roller coaster and, and far below the rate of inflation for what's going on for our prices that we can get. So any way to experiment with new ideas is, is really helpful. And I love the, you know, some of the ones that, that are kind of like you do this now and you get long-term solutions. Bale grazing is one. Another is the snow fences. Can you, can you tell people a little a bit about the, the snow fence project, Latrice? Sure. So we are looking at um, installing snow fences and that was really headed by Tyrell Finner. And so when he first started the in um, snow fence installation, it was really about seeing what the, the um, soil moisture was in the summer. And so what they were looking at is designing them based on the height and the fetch and how much snow they wanted to capture. And so that for me, I was just like, wow, you know, they're doing this for soil moisture and, you know, trying to get this data. And I was like, how can this be integrated for, for our ranchers? So we took our, our interns with, with Tyrell and Tremaine Edmo who did the um, pilot installations up at uh, Browning High School and on Blackfeet Community College with the help of um, the student interns uh, from BCC and a lot, and especially the Willow Fence modeling and in, in incorporating their ideas along with building it with Tyrell and, and Tremaine. And so, you know, it was looking at these practices that are being used, but finding ways to incorporate the cultural aspects with willow and and how that could really capture snow and so they were finding that the willow snow fences were capturing more snow versus the plastic versus the kind of a netted material um not plastic but it was kind of i forget the fi the fabric and then the rails and so they have these these different ones and so when we were out there with the interns we were studying these and they were looking at the different um fences and then they were starting to see how much greener the plants were in those areas mm -hmm. and they they were looking at because they have a control where there was no fence and, and the difference in the soil moisture mm -hmm. and so I was like you know how can we use this you know because I'm a learner I constantly say I want to learn something new every day and I'm open to learning something new every day and if I could work and go to school every day and continue learning for the rest of my life, I would because I feel like there's always something that there's more information out there and we're never going to be a professional. I, I don't consider myself a professional knowing, you know, all this information. I consider myself a professional learner because if there's something I don't know, I want to learn more about. And so for my students, the curiosity, I was like, oh my goodness, you know, like they're looking at this wind and a snow fence. And for me, it went back to research that I did as an undergrad studying a Blackfeet calendar stick in wind direction and all these other things. And that's a whole nother podcast itself. And so I remember going and studying teepee rings because of, of the calendar stick in the wind direction that the feather and how the feather worked with the wind. So I brought my interns to um, out here in Badger and I was like, all right, guys, you know, we went and looked at snow fences and now we're going to measure teepee rings. And they were kind of looking at me like, you know, why, you know? And so then I started explaining about the teepee ring base in that the way they place the teepee rings determine the stronger winds and our inverses how our teepees were made they were slanted more in the back and that was because 
the they took into account for the winds and and the predominant wind. So after they measured the teepee rings and they've seen the 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 different widths, they started to understand how our people built the teepee rings. And I was like, all right, based on these different widths and these different directions, I want you guys to design different snow fences that is material that is on ranchers' property. They can't use electric. You guys can't use any type of tools. It has to be material. So we came out to a producer's property. They looked at all the resources of what was available. And then we went back to BCC's campus and they drew up different models. And so we went with their models and we did these different measurements and we insult, installed that snow fence. And so currently that snow fence is capturing water where a stream uh, used to dry out in like the end of July and August or that snow fence was put, put in place and it's capturing snow as we speak. And we're hoping that eventually that snow will melt back into to the groundwater so we can increase our surface water flow. So just looking at ways we can work within our system because we know we have so much wind here mm -hmm. and we know the wind blows a lot of our precipitation away. So working with ways where we can try to capture more snow and not have it blow away from us. And so knowing what our environment is and knowing ways that we can work with it um, based on looking at how our people um, used to monitor it based on their lodges. So that was a, that's a snow fence and teepee ring type lesson that we use, that I use specifically for installing snow fences with my interns over the summer. Oh, I I I love this. I watch it snow here, and um, I've been here for 20, 25 years, and and it almost never comes down straight. And I've always told myself it's born on, in the Rocky Mountains and it dies in North Dakota. It just blows, <laughs> blows right across Eastern Montana. So I, I love this story and I agree. It is a whole nother podcast to, I, I'm so intrigued with this idea of the calendar stick, wind direction and snow fences. I've I've been watching what sagebrush does out here in our part of the state. There's been a war on sagebrush and on club moss for a long time because people thought that they they observe that that cattle don't eat sagebrush much and club moss not at all. And so these things must be competing and displacing our grass, but I've been taking lots of pictures of tiny little snow fences, which is every single sagebrush that is out here is, is a tiny little snow fence. And when I was um, in your part of the world last week, we were up on a bench, um, maybe 20 miles east of Browning. And I was looking at the fescue, the grasses, the bunch grass that's up there. And every one of those is a tiny little snow fence. You know, bringing me back to the idea of you know, of grazing management and how uh, the buffalo in other times and and under different situations of fencing would have had a mosaic where some parts were grazed way far down and kept in a lawn and other places would get wolfy and would only, you know, wolfy for people who don't know what that means. It means that it comes up and has a lot of dead vegetation and sometimes the plants start to die in the center and so you have everything in between from you know what what modern people today would look at and say oh that looks overgrazed to um you know to something that has a lot of diversity of heights and and a mosaic across the ground and it seems to me like one of the challenges in addition to how do you get the bison and the cattle to be able to create that type of a mosaic you know what type of management can we put in place now and the team at pecani lodge health institute through this grazing program is working on that for decades incat's atra program has been the trusted place to find practical and cutting edge answers to sustainable agriculture questions but what if you're the one with the great idea? The forum on ATRA's new website connects you with other farmers, ranchers, and land managers who are sharing their practical know-how. 
stop by at atra.incat.org and join the conversation. But the other piece is how to tell whether it's working. You know, what monitoring comes in place? How do you measure success? And there's very scientific ways that that's being done in this project. And then there's also, you know, what what is the measure of success that really matters to producers? And you wear both those hats, Latrice. You're both a scientist and a rancher. And I wonder about the whole idea of monitoring research and learning as a lifelong learner, you know, how do we say what we're learning and have that bring us forward in the future? For sure. So this brings me back to a writing class that I had at MSU and we were in that class and my professor was Paul Stoy. And I remember him giving a lecture and he was like, the thing about science is people make it so hard to understand that it becomes unrelatable. Yeah. Because yep. they can't make a connection to it. Yep. So for me, that has always stuck with me. How do I do science in a way that's impactful, but that is also in a way not simple, but that's also done in a way that is easy for myself to understand and also for my producers. And so for me, it's looking at, you know, what would be the easiest to, to see in, you know, and, you know, a lot of people aren't going to like, be like, you know, what is my soil <laughs> and what are these nutrients and why is this important? And, and, you know, when it comes down to you is the evolution of soil and soil itself is very complex. And that's what I've learned throughout all my research. And so trying to figure figure out the things that would be easiest to see. And for me, it really come down to how grazing management can change the things that we're seeing on the land now when it comes to some areas being so severely overgrazed and what those grazing and those rest periods could look like if we, when we're taking the soil infiltration rates, because that's something that you can see and it helps you understand how your soil is absorbing the water. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, that for monitoring that I could con continue to do, but also ranchers can continue after to monitor and knowing that we want our soils to act as a sponge and absorb that water quickly. And so is it happening now? Are we seeing that now? You know, because depending on the intensity of grazing and depending on how much of the plant is left behind and how much organic matters in the soil, then that's really going to tell you how your water is going to behave and how your um, soil is going to hold moisture. And that is the biggest thing when it comes to plant development, plant health, and, and also relating to animal health. And so looking at what plant communities are out there now and what plant communities were there but aren't there now. And so knowing that the diversity of plant communities is really an indicator for health and you know having those rest periods. So looking at those communities and how they're changing based on the management practices that are gonna be in place are some of the top ones. And then for me, what gets me excited is once these lands are having um, been rested and they're having these different plant communities um, develop, what is really happening with the soil respiration? Is, you know, is there more uptake happening because there's more plants being there and so they're actively taking up more carbon from the atmosphere and putting it back into the into the soil carbon sink, you know, on at what scale. And so for me, I'm always excited to get get those um, soil respiration rates prior to the grazing being done and then looking at it from a year, three years and five years and, you know, seeing if there are changes or if there aren't changes. And so for me, those are some of the physical factors that I feel can really influence 
you know, the, the management for the future, because that's some of the things that are really getting hit hard within ranching communities and finding a way where our ranchers can benefit from capturing more carbon in their soils and having markets to help sustain their ranches. Because we talk about, you know, farmers and ranchers being hit and, and the cost to do it is more than what, what they're getting back from their product. And so looking, taking all those things into consideration and trying to be innovative in ways that we can help them make their ranches profitable, but not looking at, at so much as a profitable money maker, but more of the you know, the ecological balances in and sustaining those and those paying being the biggest paying benefactor to to the producer for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything you say, it's just like, man, I, there's eight more questions that I want to ask you because it's all so fascinating. Here's a, here's a quick one. So um, I, I love infiltration tests too, as a way for telling how I'm doing with my grazing. You know, it's, it's quick, it's easy. I can see it right there. It makes sense to my mind. Um, soil respiration rates, is that, I mean, it seems like that is something that you could only do if you were a scientist and had some expensive equipment. Tell me about tell me about measuring soil respiration rates, and is there any way that that those of us that don't have Montana State University's lab behind them might be able to learn about this? And for me, Linda, that's why I said that was like my third thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh um, because it was about the soil and finding a way then the plant communities and and then looking at the diversity of increasing our plant communities and looking at the infiltration because in the end if you have those coming in and those being more sustained then ultimately you know that you don't need a soil respirometer to measure the respiration that's coming out. You know that you have these stable plant communities and there's no bare ground and they're acting as these sponges and you have this diversity of plants. For me, that looking at the land in that regard and knowing that you have these plant, healthy plant communities and the way that they're able to uptake water is so much more important than than the respiration and you know it really comes down to what are those cultural plants because different ranchers have different management plans based on where these plant communities are say there's a wetland and there's um, medicinal plants like peppermint and and plants for use for religious purposes such as um, a sweet grass and so, you know, taking those into consideration of knowing that you want to diversify those communities because they do get hard, hit harder by grazing, I feel like that value outweighs the respiration of being able to read what's, you know, being put out by, by the soil versus what's being brought in. So for me, like, yeah, it's just about the way the land's able to absorb the water because all throughout the United States, we are looking at drought effects, whether it's through grasslands or through farming, and how water is becoming less and less available. And then looking at the plant communities and knowing that diversity of the landscape has always been a natural balance. And so for me, those are my biggest indicators of, of successful management on the land as far as I look at it. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, and, and I love the fact that with your graduate research and, and with the science support that we have for this Pecani Lodge regenerative grazing practice that producers and and the team together can look at things like infiltration rates and plant species diversity. But at the same time, you are doing soil respiration so that we can link the two together and that that could eventually, as you say, maybe lead back to some reward for ecosystem services provided by good management. 
Yep, because that's that's what it's about, Linda, is maintaining that that balance and honing in that relationship to the land because we are natural land stewards. And I feel like people forget that in some ways they are indigenous to to lands. Whether it's these lands or not, you come from somewhere where the way your culture developed is an influence from your environment. And so I always tell people, you know, there's always an indigenous side to you that is directly tied back to the culture and who you are as a person. And so my culture and my worldviews directly relates to who I am and what my relationship is to land where I'm from. And so I always tell people, you have those relationships you know, and sometimes it's going back and, and honing into those because then you relearn a, a part of you and that's relearning a part of self too. Mm, wow. Profound words. I had, I had so many more questions, but I think that those, those are the words to go out on Latrice, that, that was a way to, to bring things together and bring us back to ground you know, back to, back to where we all come from somewhere. So I want to thank you for this. And I hope that this is the first of a couple podcasts that we can do, because I'm sure I'm not the only one listening to this discussion who says, I want to hear from Latrice about this calendar stick and wind direction <laughs> and, and why teepees were built the way they were. So I, I do want to just Thank you so much, Latrice, for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. And um, I, I look forward to the next four years of working on this project of regenerative grazing, um, where I can learn from you and the other people in your community about how better to take care of the Northern Prairies. So thank you. Thank you, Linda. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.